The following is a Shaw TV public affairs presentation. Michelle Mongel made her name in the BC Legislature by fighting for people who were in need. Single moms with kids, those on social assistance, disability benefits, and then all of a sudden Premier John Horgan comes along and says, hey, I'm going to make you Minister of Energy and Mines. I think a lot of people were surprised, but Michelle has done a very good job, and I think she must be growing into it as well because it's a fascinating portfolio. Good evening and welcome to Voice of BC and to give her the full title, British Columbia's Minister of Energy, Mines and Petroleum Resources. So an enormous portfolio and a very complicated one. Welcome to the show, Minister. Thank you very Good much. It's here. very nice to be here. And happy International Women's Day. Thank you. In yeah. the cabinet of the first gender balanced cabinet in British Columbia history. So interesting. Yeah, very interesting. I, I wouldn't even know what it's like to work in a, in a cabinet where we don't have gender balance. Uh, and uh, having it is, is just fantastic, right? I think it's a great role modeling for women all over, but it's also really important that our cabinet reflect our province as much as it possibly can. And we have 50% women in our population, so of course we should have 50% women in our cabinet. Some tough portfolios, the finance minister, uh, transportation, and yours, energy mines and petroleum resources. Uh, we had something nice happen in the BC legislature today, however, and that doesn't happen every day in the BC legislature, so I thought I should mention it. We have a change of rules in the House on International Women's Day, although it isn't just for women, that allows members of the legislature who are caring for infants to bring the infants into the chamber at times. That's right. And so um, there wasn't a rule that explicitly prohibited or explicitly allowed a parent to bring their infant to the floor of the legislature, to the floor of the chamber, to the house, if they needed to. But uh, faced with the numbers as they are in the house and yeah, uh, me point. being an expecting mother, and I immediately thought of, oh goodness, what if the bells ring? There's a, that a vote needs to happen. It takes me exactly five minutes to get from my office to the chamber. What if I have my baby and I, I can't pass him or her off to somebody else to look after, or I'm nursing or, or something? Yeah. Um, I can't lose the opportunity to vote on behalf of my constituents. And uh, so I talked about it with uh, the ho government house leader and with the clerk's office and with the speaker. And uh, they came together along with the uh, opposition house leader and the third party house leader and decided let's make this formal, let's make this explicitly stated in our standing orders, the rules that govern what we do, and say that yes, infants can be on the house and that, on the, on the chamber floor and, uh, and so that we're supporting young families and making this a more family friendly work environment. And, and Spencer Chandler Herbert, who, uh, two-year-old, right? No, one-year-old. No, yeah, he one just had his old. first birthday. Uh, he and his partner have a one-year-old, so he's uh, said that he may have to take advantage of it, too. I should explain the five-minute rule. So when they're having a vote in the British Columbia legislature, and government can lose votes when it's this close, uh, they ring the bells, you've got five minutes to get in the chamber, then they lock the doors. So the minister's not kidding when she says she may need the full five minutes to get in there. Uh, we once had a premier who didn't make it into the chamber and the government just about lost the tie vote. So it does happen. Uh, if you want to see the whole exchange in the House, and I say it was a nice warm moment today with all members. Uh, you could see it. It's right after question period this morning on the Parliament channel. So I think it starts at just after 11. It goes on for about 15, 20 minutes and quite a nice thing. And uh, as I said, not every day in the British Columbia legislature is that sweet, so you might want to see it. Uh, we've got a lot of questions for you, Minister, a lot of uh, questions on tape, and I think I'm going to jump right in uh, uh, on a couple of them and then catch up on a few other things. Uh, let's go to uh, liquefied natural gas. Here's Jordan Bateman. Minister, I know Andrew Weaver doesn't believe in LNG, but I think the NDP government seems to. What I want to know is this. What is your ministry actively doing to get a $40 billion investment like LNG Canada across the line. So we've had some of these projects that sort of fell off the table, right? There's still a few that are still active, I think. Very, very much so, actually. Um, global market prices are going to be the number one predictor for uh, the type of investment that's needed for, for such large projects 
projects. And that's why, unfortunately, this summer we saw Petronas uh, leave uh, its plans for uh, Pacific, West, Pacific Northwest LNG. And, um, but LNG Canada is uh, still very much uh, committed to working in British Columbia. And that's they, in Kitimat. And that's in Kitimat, yes. And uh, they are anticipating to have a final investment decision uh, within this calendar year. And so they are still very much actively uh, pursuing. There's, there's other projects as well, such as um, Quispa, which is uh, formerly Steelhead, um, Kitimat LNG, which is a, a partnership between Chevron and Woodside. And so... There's other projects. In fact, uh, the first shipment of LNG was uh, by Fortis. Oh, and yes. Yes, yeah. This, that's uh, in the Lower Mainland, right? That's correct, in the Lower Mainland, and that happened uh, just a few months ago. And so, but in terms of where does the NDP stand in all of this, well, it's, it was interesting over the last, uh, let's see now, seven years, um, the Green Party accused us of always being supportive of LNG, and the Liberals always accused us of, his, of of us of being against LNG. The fact is, is for the last seven years, we've had the exact same policy and we've never changed, is that we want to see LNG go forward, but there's four conditions it needs to meet, and that's there has to be good training and uh, job opportunities for British Columbians. British Columbia needs to be able to see the benefit of its resources, meaningful, strong partnerships with First Nations, and the ability to still meet our climate action goals and to protect our earth, land, and water. And what we're finding when it comes to meaningful partnerships with First Nations, well, the test is what do the First Nations say? And so when I met uh, many of the First Nations, especially the, the 21 First Nations that are along the line for, for LNG Canada from well to tide water, many of them, the first time they met with me, said, we want to make sure that you're going to see this through and that you're going to see LNG Canada uh, happen because it's so important for our community, not just mm -hmm. the economic development opportunity, but many of them had um, community-wide votes after they did their own environmental assessment process and those communities came out in, in strong support of LNG Canada. So, uh, so the, these companies are working really, really hard in partnership with First Nations, in partnership with local non-Indigenous communities as well, and uh, they're wanting to ensure that there's good jobs opportunity, good apprenticeship opportunities, and what are we doing to get that LNG Canada $40 billion investment here uh, going forward? To answer Jordan's question wow. is... Um, as soon as uh, I was uh, given this portfolio and given the full backstory of what had been going on, and of course I was on the job six days when Petronas decided to uh, pull out for global market pricing, and uh, I, I instructed my ministry to move forward with looking at how do we be competitive in the current global market pricing, in the current climate. And so we've done that work and uh, we've identified ways in which we can increase our competitiveness. We've put that forward to LNG Canada and they are bringing that forward to their uh, primary decision makers, their investors, as part of their uh, final investment decision process. Hmm. Uh, talk about LNG, uh, you get into controversy, you're right with the Green Party. And here's a question from Christina Winter of the Green Party. Minister Mungal, you've previously praised the LNG industry and natural gas industry as being very forward thinking when it comes to reducing greenhouse gases. However, the greenhouse gas of most concern with natural gas extraction is methane. And when it comes to methane, these industries are anything but forward thinking. 85% of active gas wells are currently spewing methane into our atmosphere daily and 35% of inactive or abandoned wells continue to leak methane into the environment. This is despite the fact that the technology exists in low emitting or zero emitting pneumatic devices that would allow these industries to contain and minimize their emissions, even capturing the gas back for sale. Recent research has showed that methane emissions from BC's shale gas areas are 2.5 times higher than BC government estimates. Minister Mungal, how can you claim that these industries are forward looking at reducing emissions when they neither record and report their emissions accurately, nor install the technologies that would allow them to reduce their overall emissions? 
It's a complicated ministry. That's a long question. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, well, there's a few things that I'm going to deconstruct there. So um, about the industry, one of the things that uh, the industry is looking to do is to electrify as much as possible. So right now, a lot of the compression, a lot of the production of natural gas and, and, and uh, the extraction, uh, the energy that's uh, allowing all of that to happen is natural gas itself. And so the industry is actually looking to get off fossil fuels and, and electrify using renewable electricity. So that's going to reduce the overall GHG emissions. Now she's talking about methane leaks and, and it, no one's denying that this is an issue and in fact um, the um, I was going to just drop an acronym and I'll, I'll spell ahead. it out, sorry. Uh, the um, Oil and Gas Commission, the OGC, which is an independent ar regulator arm of government, is partnering with uh, UBC and Geoscience BC to uh, increase the well monitoring in terms of methane leaks into the groundwater system. So they're actually expanding their monitoring um, function to get the data and so that we can find ways to reduce it and make sure that we're doing it in the best possible way. Uh, another thing that we're doing as a new government and uh, we'll be making the announcement in just a couple of weeks is our scientific panel on hydraulic fracturing. I was going to ask you where that stood, so good. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I've we just... So you squirt a whole lot of water down into, way down into the earth. Yeah, about you three to four kilometers you down. You shatter the rock down there and releases the gas in it and that's how that's how we develop our gas in British Columbia. That's been going correct. On for a long time, since 1950. So the issue is: is it safe? E exactly. So what what are some of the problems that occur from this type of industrial activity? So uh, concerns around uh, contamination of groundwater, uh, methane leaks induced seismicity as well and so the our occasional small earthquake that's right and uh, so our scientific panel is going to be looking at all of that to make sure that we have good solid knowledge in the public sphere and that we're able to better regulate uh, based on that knowledge but also to work with industry to incentivize them to do things better there's always room for improvement I think everybody acknowledges that and when I sit down with industry and talk to them about uh, what our plans are uh, they agree. There's always le learning opportunities for for them to do better. You got asked in the house last fall about somebody suggested a moratorium while this review takes place, and your mm -hmm. answer was, "Get real. The gas that comes to my house, the gas that comes to your house, is fracked right That's now. right. Yep. And so we couldn't shut it all down while we review, but there is going to be a review. That's right. I can't imagine anybody here who, uh, anybody in BC who relies on natural gas to heat their home and heat their water suddenly saying, yeah, sure, put a moratorium on it. I don't want to have a warm home and I don't want to have a nice hot shower in the morning. I, I, I have not met the person who says that. Well, we have a question from Judy Tayabji. Uh, oh, what the hell. Let's just run it. Here she is. <laughs> I have a question for this minister. Having chased out the largest potential single investment in Canadian history when Pacific Northwest left last year because of the change in government, I mean, I know they cited market conditions because they're really polite, but we all know that when we have a premier and a minister of environment writing letters saying we oppose this, they're going to go somewhere else. And since then, we've seen record investments in Alaska and Washington State. So obviously, the market conditions are ripe. Well, now we have a chance with LNG Canada to see a really significant investment in Kitimat. Thousands of jobs, billions of dollars in revenue to the Crown, to, for the people of BC. So I want to know what is this minister doing to make sure that that investment actually lands in BC? Because it matters. So one thing I will ask you about, you meant, she's mentioned the Petronas thing. Uh, three members of the current legislature did join the occupation of the island where Petronas was going to try to locate. Lilu it's Island. Lilu Island. And I see last week that the First Nations leader who was leading that occupation lost his court case. Mm -hmm. uh, a significant portion of that First Nation supported the development. He opposed it and he failed to make the case in court that he had a legitimate claim. So is there any regrets around that that your party got involved in essentially a, a claim that didn't stand up? Well, f first I just want to hand it to Judy for being always on point with her partisanship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. Yeah. Um, 
So around Lilu Island, so uh, the Lax Kalams and many of the First Nations and many of the local communities in the Prince Rupert area uh, did not support the location of Pacific West, Pacific Northwest LNG. Yep. And I'm so used to saying the acronym. That's okay. And um, so they didn't, they didn't, it wasn't that they didn't support the project, they didn't support the location of the project, which was Lilu Island. It had um, a long-standing spiritual significance and uh, closeness with the, the salmon runs is my understanding. And so what we said is that we support those local communities in. And what a lot of people don't actually know is that because the, the news was that Petronas was uh, closing its interests uh, for a liquefied natural gas facility in BC. But what they had actually done, in my understanding, is they actually had recited where they would be uh, putting their, their trains and that would have been on Ridley Island, which is uh, an industrial island. There's a lot of industrial activities going on there. Alta Gas just is starting yeah. to put its uh, liquefied... That's where the airport is in Rupert. Too, yeah, 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 propane and, and so on. So there's um, so, so that was a better location, and it actually was going to end up saving the money in the end, but the numbers weren't working out for them uh, when it came to what's going on with the global market, pr market pricing. They were really clear on that, and again, this happened six days into our government. So my question back to Judy is where were her friends in terms of ensuring that BC was competitive in a changing environment? They weren't anywhere. We, on the other hand, took action. I'm seeing, though, reports uh, out of China and uh, from some of the big energy producers and some of the big think tanks saying that, you know, liquid nat liquefied natural gas demand is going to recover uh, and there will be increased demand. China's buying a lot of it. Do you think we'll see it here one of these days? I, I do. So what happened is that as uh, LNG started to really come online around the world is you had a bit of a gold rush, right? Mm -hmm. Prices shot up. You had those gold rush prices. Everybody went for it in terms of uh, wanting to develop mm -hmm. uh, LNG plants. That brings the price down and you end up having a glut on the market. And then things come back up and they start to stabilize. So things are going to start to come back up and uh, the anticipation is by about 2020. And from there on we'll see a bit more of a stabilized yeah. pricing. You'll see your ups and downs, but that big initial gold rush yeah. price uh, we probably won't see yeah. again. Takes about, uh, as I recall, about four years uh, to build one if they decide to go ahead. So if the decision was yes later this year, then uh, what are we at? Uh, it'll be 2022, 2023 before up and running and shipping and stuff. That's uh, right. They'll a, likely hit big, that sweet spot. And there's still a federal issue with this too, right? That's uh, right. There, we're, we're trying to get the federal government to allow importing um, terminals or built in pieces overseas and assembled here. And you need to persuade the the tariff people to let them come in without putting a big tariff on them, right? So what is uh, what we have right now in Canada at the federal level is some anti-dumping tariffs, yeah. right? So other jurisdictions in the world who manufacture steel products um, at a cheaper rate than what we do here in Canada can't just dump their products in Canada. Uh, the difference here is that um, the type of uh, fabricated steel that's required for what's called these, these LNG trains are not constructed anywhere in North America at all, not constructed in Canada. Uh, they are constructed overseas, and so uh, to be able to even construct these trains, uh, we would require to bring, the yeah. LNG Canada, for example, would be required to bring those uh, components over. Now, should they be penalized? Because they're not, there's not there's no dumping going on, and it's not that that could have been manufactured in, in Canada. Uh, so, so they're working with the federal government on this. Uh, we'll be back with the minister, and I bet you're wondering when I'm going to ask her about Site C, and I will, I will, I will. Uh, stay with us on Voice of BC. We'll be right back. Recent reports have raised the possibility that the Site C mega dam would be used to power mines in the Yukon. That is, of course, if it's not used to power fracking or the export of liquefied fracked gas or the Alberta tar sands. It's misleading to claim that Site C is clean power when it seems destined to provide power to projects that are environmental disasters.
My name is Irene Lansinger, and I'm the president of the BC Federation of Labour, and I love politics. My work is politics, my play is politics, I'm about politics all the time, and that's what Voice of BC is about. So come back to hear some more politics. There are more ways to connect with us at Voice of BC. Email us at vobc at shaw.ca. Follow us on Twitter at Voice of BC. Or like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash VOBC on Shaw TV. Minister Mungal has already proved that she's willing to shed a bit of her activist past when it comes to issues like the Site C Dam, a project that she campaigned against but is going forward because it's the right thing to do. Hopefully she does the same with LNG and with the Kinder Morgan pipeline. We need these projects, we need this private investment in British Columbia, we need to keep British Columbians working. Come on, Jordan, as the song says, two out of three ain't bad. Let's stay with the uh, minister. Lots of questions for her. Go back to BC Business Council. Jock Finlayson, here he is. Minister, I don't know if you saw the uh, news reports uh, based on a speech given by Steve Williams, the president and chief executive of Suncor, the largest Canadian-based energy company. He said in early February that Suncor was no longer looking at investing in new or greenfield projects in Canada. Canada's become too costly, too uncertain, and too complex to undertake major new energy investments. The only capital that the company will be deploying in Canada going forward is sustaining capital to help fund their existing operations. Are you and your government worried about the seeming decline of confidence in the energy industry to invest in Canada and the outflows of capital that appear to be accelerating? Minister. I don't know if I agree with uh, Jock's analysis based on uh, one uh, CEO's particular decision. Um, what we're seeing in BC, for example, in the mining industry is that we're seeing increased investment. Commodity prices are coming back up. But not only that, is that there's going to be, the, the prediction is in the future is there's going to be quite a lot of demand for minerals that are found in British Columbia because our world is changing, whether it's uh, iPhones or electric cars or wind turbines or solar panels. All the raw materials that go into these products are items that are found here in, in BC mines. And so um, what the prediction is, is that uh, mining is going to be a great uh, industry and that's exactly why we're seeing some, of, uh, some serious investment uh, in, just in the last six months alone. And uh, a follow-up question on mining, uh, something that happened under the last government that's still a loose end hanging out there, uh, Bruce Halzer, here he is. You were the critic in opposition when um, the Mount Polly report came down and you had a lot to say about that. Now that you're the minister responsible, are you looking to reopen that decision or are you generally satisfied to, uh, to leave it behind us? And do you think that... Um, there needs to be any new rules or new legislation with respect to mine safety and especially with respect to tailing ponds and dams. Uh, so first, uh, if you'll recall from the, the top of the hour, and of course, Vaughn, you uh, were there. I was not the critic. Uh, when uh, that Mount Pauly disaster took place, uh, I was the critic for social development. Um, Nevertheless, uh, in terms of moving forward with mine safety, well, that'll be one of the very items that is in the terms of reference for the Mining Jobs Task Force that I announced last week. And so we have a group of 12 people coming together to identify how we can ensure that we have good family supporting jobs in the mining industry going forward. That can sustain the commodity pricing fluctuation, but also how do we make sure that our job sites are uh, healthy and safe places for people to work because everybody has the right to go to work in the morning or at the beginning of a shift 
and be able to go home at the end of the day without injury. And so we need to be considering the importance of mine site safety for workers, but also for the communities at large. And one of the things that came out from the, the Mount Polly disaster, as well as from the Auditor General, is that we need to have an independent compliance and enforcement unit. And so we're working on that in my ministry. And it, it looks different in different jurisdictions on how you'd actually do that. But what most jurisdictions have found as a best practice is that it, it stays within the ministry or a state department. Um, but the people who do the permitting are not the same people who do the compliance and enforcement. That means you have more boots on the ground, you have more eyes looking at these sites and making sure that they're safe, not only for the workers, but for the community as a whole. So that you're going to probably separate those? That's right. That's what we're working on right now. Um, uh, well, you put out a press release last fall. Uh, well, first of all, it was in the NDP election platform that you were going to freeze BC Hydro rates for a year. And then there was a press release announcing that you'd kept the promise to freeze them. And then, well, I guess what was it, just last week, we discovered they're not being frozen because the BC Utilities Commission turned down the freeze. So was it a mistake to promise it when you weren't sure you could deliver? Was it a mistake to say you'd done it when you hadn't and uh, you didn't overrule the Utilities Commission, how come? Uh, so in, in that very press yes. release, and I spent days, you'll remember, in uh, budget estimates yes. uh, answering questions from uh, both the Greens and the Liberals and was very clear that we were always going to go to the BC Utilities Commission. And I guess we kind of took it for granted that people would appreciate that that's exactly what we had to do because that is the appropriate process. But of course, after 16 years where you had a Liberal government that would more often than not direct uh, the BC Utilities Commission to actually increase hydro rates, um, people might have forgotten that that was the appropriate process and that was always the process that we would go through because this government wants to respect that independence of that regulator. And I'm glad that we did because we learned a lot about uh, BCUC's review, not just of uh, our request for a rate freeze, but of the, the broader rates plan. We learned that there's a, we have a bit of a financial mess mm -hmm. at BC Hydro. It's a mess that this government is going to have to clean up and we mm -hmm. will do that. Uh, there's concerns that have been long raised by auditor generals about the deferral accounts, yep. which are now at about $6 billion. The uh, $50 billion in liabilities to various independent power producers, that was uh, something that we raised a, as an alarm back in 2008 and 2009. And uh, we're very clear that it was not right for ratepayers to have to pay inflated costs for these uh, for these um, private power projects. Um, the Liberals went ahead with that and now that issue has come home to roost and the BCUC highlighted it. And those are the reasons why, among a few others, that BCUC said, no, we can't do a rate freeze at this time because um, BC Hydro just does not have the, the financial capacity to do that. So hugely disappointing when I talk to people around BC who are like I said, as the social development critic, people I know who are living in poverty, every dollar counts for them. So while the average person would have only saved $23 on their bill, for some people that really meant a lot. And so we want to make sure that we're still helping the people who really need it the most out. And that's why in May we'll have available a crisis grant that people can apply for from BC Hydro to help them with their bill when they see a crisis and it's impacting their ability to pay and a more long-term solution which is allowing for lifeline rates and we're going to be working on the legislation mm -hmm. this spring uh, and bringing it forward this spring uh, to do that. The, uh, you sort of imagine the situation over at the BC Utilities Commission because the Minister's right, the Liberals overruled it, they removed whole projects from the power of view. The Commission sitting there going, well, we'll make a decision on this one. I wonder if they'll let us make it. They did. <laughs> they let them make it. Uh, what? Well, uh, well, let Thielman ask the question because it does raise a, a really interesting question about future of uh, energy regulation in British Columbia. Here's Bill. Minister, the BC Utilities Commission had a tough job to look at the Site C dam issues in a real hurry, unusual for them. But what is the future of the BC Utilities Commission? In the past, governments of all stripes have tended to avoid it from time to time on controversial issues. What do you see as its future? Strengthen it? It has a, an incredibly important role, absolutely. I, I think that uh, having an independent regulator takes the politics out of uh, mm -hmm. 
playing around with BC Hydro and uh, mm. playing around with rates, playing around with uh, projects and so on. It, it provides a very sobering view. I mean, that's exactly what they did with uh, uh, Site C when we learned that the actual cost was going to be higher than what the Liberals said it would be. And so uh, they have a very important role. And how do we ensure that it stays as a strong independent regulator going forward? My understanding is that the Auditor General wants to uh, take a look at mm -hmm. that very issue. Um, there was a core review of BCUC done as well in 2014, 2015. Oh. And Why don't you uh, look that up? Yes, I uh, can get you a copy of uh, the report. And um, a lot of the things that that core review suggested, BCUC has been implementing ever since. And their last report that's going to be made public soon um, highlights some of the major administrative things that, you know, sound, they're not very sexy. They're not very exciting to the average person. But the average person is benefiting from them in terms of their capacity and their ability uh, to deliver as an independent regulator. Uh, the minister mentioned the question of the deferral accounts, and um, they started piling up in the last decade. Uh, it was the Auditor General, actually, that first uh, blew the whistle on them. And while it may not seem all that sexy, discovering that I, uh, Hydro has taken about $6 billion of current spending and pushed it down the road, deferred it to be repaid at some future date. Uh, it's nice stuff if you can do it with your family finances, but I wouldn't particularly recommend it. Uh, in any event, that's some of the things you can get from an independent regulator, and I think the idea of strengthening uh, BCUC and affirming its independence is probably a good thing. Uh, Jamie Lawson out at uh, UVic with a question about clean energy. Here he is. I noticed that with George Heyman, you've recently announced about $600,000 for clean energy initiatives in communities. And there's another program of about $2.5 million for clean energy vehicle purchases. Now, all that's kind of neat, and I really enjoyed looking at the solar-powered Zamboni fact. But I wonder, given the extent of the climate crisis we're facing, according to the major scientists of the world, isn't this really small change given the transition that we've got to do to meet BC's climate goals? A uh, fair guess that a lot more to come. Oh yes, uh, we're just getting started. I will say though, in the budget update in September, there was $40 million there for a zero emission vehicle program. And that's spread out over three years to incentivize people to buy zero emission vehicles, but also to work with communities in charging stations. Now, I live in rural BC. I have one of the highest passes, road passes uh, uh, in the country. My concern is not only range anxiety, but weather anxiety as well. And so um, mm -hmm. the incentive to buy electric vehicles is really great for lower mainland. But what do we do for rural areas? And so that's part of the mm -hmm. overall thing that we need to start looking at as we want to roll out more, uh, pardon the pun, roll out more mm -hmm. electric vehicles around, uh, around the province and really start transitioning our transportation fleets. And so there's a lot of things we need to be looking at. Um, I know that Minister Heyman is uh, doing his part with his with the Climate Council. We're going to be putting forward an energy roadmap for my ministry in terms of how do we uh, look at uh, transportation switch, uh, switching fuels and so on. Um, how do we increase our renewables to meet that future demand and, and so on. How, a lot of uh, rural communities that are in remote areas are on diesel. They're not even connected yeah. to the grid. How do we work with them so that they can build their own renewable energy and renewable capacity as well. So for those out there who are very interested in the whole energy file, they'll know what I meant by capacity because you, you produce, but then you have to have something that's like a battery for later. So so these are all the things that we're going to be looking at. And so I, I anybody interested, you know, stay tuned because this is one of the reasons that I really want to be the Minister of Energy and Mines and uh, because there's there's so many exciting things. We're at a transition phase, I think, in, in our society and the things that we get to do going forward, looking into the future is really exciting. I got an update this week on the electrical vehicle charging station at the BC Legislature, which is just outside the building. We're taping this show. And uh, of course, Andrew Weaver is always hogging it and plugged in. <laughs> and, then, and then Adam Olson comes along and Michael Lee. So anyway, I gather they're adding 
charging stations because there's already so much demand from members of the legislature. To charge the demand up. is only going yeah. up all yeah. around the province. Yeah. So we get more. Uh, let's we have time. Yes, we do. Ken Wu, here he is. So now that the BC NDP have committed to spending at least another seven billion dollars to complete the Site C dam, which still might not be completed as a result of lawsuits by First Nations and protests and blockades, um, I'm wondering: is there any money left over uh, to support? Um, the classic clean energy initiatives like wind power, like tidal power, like geothermal, and like um, solar power? Hmm. Well, the short answer to his question, and the Liberals, uh, as you would know from question period the last week, would love this, yes, okay. <laughs> if we're looking for a yes or no answer. Um, but but absolutely there is. And I mean, his numbers are a bit wrong in terms of uh, Site C. The original plan was closer to $9 billion and, and we have now identified it as actually being more $10.7 billion. Billion's still a lot of money, so I don't want to um, dismiss that, but, uh, but I just want to make sure the numbers are correct. So um, in terms of where we are seeing our en future energy production, projections. What, what are people going to need? Uh, well, if we want to achieve our goals to reduce cl our greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore we're going to have to look at the energy that we're using. And so that means the opportunity for producing renewable energy is a lot bigger than we might actually think. And so not only what some of the projections are suggesting is not only are we going to need a site C, that amount of energy and capacity that comes with it, we're going to need at least two, and then maybe even more. And so uh, looking into the future, even conservatively, there is opportunity not just for the large dam, but also for smaller projects. Now, I mentioned those communities that are off-grid, but First Nations have a real interest in starting to build their own energy assets, similar to like what the city of Nelson has, yeah. for example, which is what I'm most familiar with in terms of a small scale uh, energy re asset. We have our own power supply, we have our own transmission, we have our own distribution, billing, everything. Uh, so a lot of First Nations communities uh, want to have something similar. They want to have that asset uh, for future generations benefit. And, and I think that's fantastic. And so we committed as part of, uh, a part of going forward with Site C is that we're going to be working with First Nations on a program that would do exactly mm -hmm. that. And there's been uh, the Utilities Commission report on, on uh, Site C also mentioned some other options. There's a couple of geothermal projects in BC, one of them associated with the First Nation. That's, you know, we, haven't, we haven't really tried geothermal here, so that's one that so, might, so might, there might be a possibility. Geothermal, it, it's, it's a bit tough in BC. Yeah. A lot of people would guess that it's not. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, extended the permitting process for exploration with Borealis near uh, Valemont. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we're looking to to have a, an energy purchase agreement with them as well, uh, should they prove successful. Uh, it needs to be a certain temperature and a certain pressure and all these things for it to work in terms of generating electricity. Now, geothermal, in terms of heating homes, lots of opportunity there. But when it comes to generating electricity, it's, it's not, not been that successful for us yeah. in BC. <laughs> but that doesn't mean people aren't still uh, exploring it. Yeah. Uh, take a brief break with the minister on Voice of BC. One more section, and God, let's see, one, two, at least two more questions on Site C. How exciting. Stay with us. People talk the talk, and what people want is the action. Indigenous people are fed up with people saying they're going to do one thing and then doing something, something else. You know, you can talk about enshrining UNRIP in legislation and then not follow it. You can talk about enshrining climate targets in legislation and then not do anything. To me, what's critical is that you take steps and actions to deliver in this area. You've landed on the right channel. I'm George Heyman, MLA for Vancouver Fairview, and you're watching Voice of BC, where you're going to hear great questions and the answers that you need to hear about the issues affecting you.
There's an old saying that the worst day in government is better than the best day in opposition. But I suspect Energy and Mines Minister Michel Mangal, on the day that the Site C decision had to be made, was thinking back to the days in opposition, where it was a lot easier to criticize than to take the heat for a decision that is a tough one. Welcome back to Voice of BC. Site C, yes. Uh, there were a lot of people who had a lot of questions for the show. And I still get emails every day from people who think that Site C is going to be canceled or stopped or not happen or be a disaster. Um, it was a tough decision. Uh, I tried to get it down to two or three outstanding issues. Here's one of them. And we're going to Caitlin Vernon, Sierra Club. Here she is. This government has promised to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Yet the approval of the Site C mega dam flies in the face of this commitment. To approve a dam that is opposed by the nations who live there and is intended to provide subsidized power to multinational fracking and LNG corporations is completely disrespectful of Indigenous rights. How are you going to ensure that the UN Declaration is more than just hollow words? Well... I would like to start by saying that First Nations are not a homogenous group. They are diverse. They have diverse opinions within their own communities and they are diverse amongst themselves. Just like uh, Europe has multiple cultures and multiple nations, well before my ancestors came here in 1636 and before anybody sailed across the Atlantic, First Nations uh, had multiple nations with their distinct cultures, their distinct languages, their distinct spiritualities. To lump all of them as the same is just not right. And for Site C, a lot of people have done that, when in fact that's not the case at all. I actually sat down with all eight, um, sorry, seven of the uh, eight Treaty 8 First Nations on, on uh, the BC side of the border. And yes, there are two nations who are very, very adamantly opposed and their communities are by and large uh, unified on this. Uh, there's uh, one First Nation that was very much pro Site C. And then the other nations, I would say, had some mix in, in their communities and in the end decided to um, sign impact benefit agreements uh, with Site C. And their presentations to us were that they weren't going to tell us which direction to go. They were just going to tell us what kind of outcome they wanted for their nation, should we go forward with it or should we not go forward with it. And uh, it was a, a very uh, powerful day sitting down with uh, all the nations that both Minister Fraser and I did. And we did it in the spirit of UNDRIP. We did it in the, in the spirit of reconciliation where we were working uh, with them and hearing them and, and having a better understanding of their perspective rather than just being briefed by staff as can often be the case in government. And so um, going forward uh, there are still uh, both uh, the West Moberly and uh, Prophet River remain opposed to Site C and that is their right. They are entitled to have an opinion. they're in court this summer I believe that's against right. BC Hydro. That's so. right and, and th that's their right. Nevertheless, we're going to continue to work with them and other nations on a very important issue for all of them, which was the realignment of Highway 29. The original proposal um, went through some sacred sites, and uh, they were very concerned, and they wanted that original po proposal changed, and that's exactly what we're doing. The highway has to be moved because eventually the existing routing will be underwater when the water starts rising behind the dam. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that the the rerouting is being rerouted is what you're telling. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and because we want to accommodate and make sure that First Nations sacred sites and traditional burial sites are respected, mm. and uh, and so that's what we're doing. Mm. Uh, Christina Winter again, the Green Party, and another Site C question, and the last actually. Here she is. Minister Mungal, your government has approved the Site C Dam project in spite of the current massive cost overruns, warnings from the BC Utilities Commission that the project is unlikely to be completed on time or on budget, and evidence from other jurisdictions of the perils that projects such as Site C and Muskrat Falls can have for the public purse. Minister Mungal, do you think that the costs for Site C will rise above $10.7 billion? It's a good question. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that it doesn't. We want to keep this project 
on budget, we identified, well, the BCUC identified that it was likely not going to stick to the the Liberals' original budget. And it's really interesting how the Liberals came to that original number because um, my understanding is they chose a number that in, in the modeling process had a 50% chance of having cost overruns. Right. I don't think that's very conservative. I don't think that's the uh, very fiscally prudent. Uh, we chose uh, a, a total that had a 90% chance of being met, yeah. so that it would don't not have any of those cost overruns. And uh, so we, we chose that number, which is $10.7 billion. And I don't think we would have really understood and appreciated how that uh, calculation under the Liberals was not appropriate if it wasn't for the BCUC, which goes to show exactly why you should always go to the BCUC with these types of projects. Uh, what we're going to do, though, to make sure that we stay at that 10.7 is that we, uh, we've put in a new project assurance board. So there was a Site C project board under the previous government. It met quite infrequently, and uh, it didn't have, um, I would say, some of the necessary expertise. So we want people who know what it is to build a large project, who have had experience in terms of turnarounds, when uh, something was uh, not going as it should, and then turning it around and getting it back on time and on budget. And uh, we are going to be announcing our project assurance board very shortly. I have to make some phone calls to a few more of the people we've identified mm -hmm. with the skills necessary. They're going to be meeting on a monthly basis, uh, so frequently. And not only are they going to be reporting back to the board of BC Hydro, they're going to be reporting <coughs> back to Treasury Board. So for those who don't know what Treasury Board is, that's a, a board of ministers and, and MLAs who uh, have the responsibility as well as uh, a, a whole staff uh, to dot all those I's, cross all those T's, and count all those pennies. Toughest minded financial analysts in the government uh, are behind Treasury Board, and that's the staff. Uh, they're the ones who say no to spending requests all the time. Ministers find it sobering sometimes to go in front of <laughs> Treasury Board. Uh, I wanted to ask you what, what I get the construction updates every two weeks from the Site C project and tell you what they're working on there, and then, of course, they're working away and they have been all the way through. Um, what are the next big things happening on the project? There's a huge contract mm -hmm. for building the generating station and spillways. That's coming fairly soon now? Fairly soon, yes. BC Hydro is uh, just uh, completing its due diligence on the bids that were put forward. And uh, so they're completing that uh, full due diligence process and uh, they'll be making their announcement soon enough. And then there's a couple of transmission lines and there's contracts to relocate the highway to come too, right? That's right. And, and, and before we uh, finalize those contracts to relocate yeah. the highway, we need to complete our work with uh, First Nations First communities Nation. as well as uh, yeah. uh, the Boone family, for example, yeah. and other landowners in the area. Yeah. The main civil works are still under construction. There is a diversion of the river which because of runoff conditions happens, can only really happen in September of a given year. And uh, is that still 2019 or has that now been pushed off to 2020? Uh, my understanding is still 2019. I, yeah. don't, I don't think I've seen any changes. Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. You're yeah. normally very on top of these things yeah, as well. I, so. um, the old guy's memories fade. You know? <laughs> it's kind of sad, really. You know? uh, let's go to Bill Tillman. Good question. Beyond Site C. Here's Bill. Minister, BC is increasing its carbon tax and the federal government is also ensuring that all Canadian provinces have a carbon tax soon. Are you concerned, however, with what impact it has on industries that are competing internationally with countries that have no carbon tax and that can undercut Canadian producers for things like coal and other minerals? And what are you going to do with all the money? <laughs> right. Um, so it goes up on the 1st of April. Yep. And it'll go up on the 1st of April every year by five bucks, which is about, what, two cents a liter on gasoline, I think? Something like that, yeah. Your math has done better yeah. than mine, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, we don't have Andrew Weaver here. He has a degree in advanced mathematics, and he can sort these things out. Anyway, let's go. Um, so the answer to that is is yes. We want to ensure that we remain competitive in BC, but we also want to make sure that we're reducing our carbon emissions and that we have the right incentives as right as well as the right disincentives um, for industry for individuals in terms of reducing our overall carbon emissions. And so uh, the carbon tax is 
not going away uh, here in BC, but what can we do to make sure that it's not a deterrent for investment in British Columbia? Those are some of the things that the uh, Climate Action Council with Minister Heyman that they're looking into okay. as well. And the money uh, under the Liberals, they used to offset it with tax breaks and things that they said were tax breaks. Uh, your government is keeping the money. Have you figured out how you're going to spend it yet? Yeah, so we've always felt, and you know what, a lot of people I've talked to around BC feel the exact same way, is that revenue neutral, well, what's the point? What's the point of having a carbon tax to act as a disincentive for carbon emissions if we're not doing anything to actually support individuals and industry in reducing carbon emissions? So that's what the tax is for. It's going to be levying a tax to raise funds so that we can turn around and find ways to give people alternatives to mm -hmm. ca their carbon emissions. So whether that's transit, whether that's electrifying industry, or say there's a mine in a remote area that uh, is uh, doing all of their work and producing all of their energy using diesel, how can uh, perhaps we partner with them to get them off the diesel and, and on to a renewable source? And uh, as I recall, there's also low income, more low income incentives coming, right? Or That's relief right. for people for whom uh, it is a burden and there, there may be more coming along that line. That's right, but, but yeah. I'm not going to steal the thunder from Minister yeah. James or Minister Heyman. Well, she's Heyman. already flagged some of that. <laughs> yeah, she was on the show too, you know. Uh, okay, let's go to a nice political question. Bruce Halser, here he is. Minister, I get very concerned when I hear your coalition partner, Andrew Weaver, talk about how the BC government should essentially process the Trans Mountain Pipeline to death. Basically drag out permitting until uh, it's just not financially viable for Trans Mountain to go forward. That to me flies in the face of the rule of law in this province and, you know, good process, fair process for people who want to invest here. What's your view on using permits as a way to slow this thing down? Uh, and Bruce Halzer is more, mere moments away as soon as we get an answer from the minister on that one. Uh, well, we haven't been using the permitting process to uh, slow the Trans Mountain Pipeline down because of the rule of law. And we are following the law and we are using the law as well. And so uh, the public will know uh, the things that we've done, which is, is intervene your status in the appeal process, uh, as well as um, seeking a reference um, uh, in terms of uh, our jurisdiction in governing uh, environmental, governing the coastline, and so on. And so this is all playing out in the media right now. But in terms of the permitting process, uh, we have not been delaying or anything. Uh, what we have been doing is asking Kinder Morgan to do its job, dot its I's, cross its T's, sharpen its pencils, do the permitting process properly and making sure that it follows the same rules as everybody else. Uh, suggestion today, if you're watching us on Thursday, live in the throne speech in the province of Alberta from Premier Notley that Alberta is looking at other options. They've given up on the wine boycott and they've taken that off the table, but uh, and other options to deal with British Columbia if there's obstruction of the pipeline construction out here. And she says one of the things may be that they would reduce the flow of oil to British Columbia. And I've seen some suggestion today in very short-term media response that, well, that might drive up the price of gasoline at the, at the pump to buy another dollar or something. Uh, what do you think? Uh, well, I found it uh, a very interesting um, uh, suggestion coming from the Alberta government. And, and, and for the record, you know, their job is to advocate for their residents and our job is to advocate for our residents and our residents don't agree on this pipeline. And, and, and frankly, my view is that uh, we need to defend our coast. We need to defend the uh, economic uh, um, jobs, the economic activity that is happening on our coast as it is, and we don't need to be putting that at risk. Uh, but in terms of uh, shutting off uh, oil and gas to uh, BC, um, well, it, it doesn't quite work that way anymore where government can just make that decision. Uh, most of that is uh, controlled in private hands in terms of who owns the pipelines and, and who puts things through the pipelines and what they pay and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I'm not too sure exactly what she's saying there and what uh, ultimately she might mean by that, but I don't see it being uh, a strong possibility. Well, I guess what she's saying is you're saying out there in BC you don't want our oil, so we're saying you can't have our oil. Is that not what she's saying? Uh, well, 
<laughs> that could be what she's saying. You'd have to ask her. We'll uh, I said that Bruce Halzer would be asking a political question, and here he is. In the last election, your popular vote dropped about 9% in your riding. That's down uh, more than 16% since Corky Evans used to hold it. A longtime NDP riding next door to you went BC Liberal, and you're one of now only four NDP MLAs in the entire BC interior. What do you think the NDP has to do to reverse this trend and start winning back votes in the interior of our province? Uh, well, I could probably correct him on some of his, his numbers there first. Uh, uh, so Corky in 2005 uh, won um, with a very strong majority, around 58%. Uh, but that was not his percentages in the 1990s. In fact, he was more in the 40, uh, 45, yeah. 46 percentile. Um, 2001, he, he lost the election. So the reason why I'm sharing those numbers is that uh, they fluctuate from election to election to election. And uh, unfortunately, nobody is doing polling to exactly find out why people might be switching their vote or why new people are voting and why they're voting a particular way. And uh, so, so my best guess in um, this last election is it, it often it depends on, on candidates in a, in a rural area to see about a 2, 3, even a 5% uh, change mm -hmm. in vote and what kind of campaigns they're running. So, for example, there, both uh, the Liberals and the Greens ran a much stronger campaign. They had really strong female candidates. Uh, I think both of them... Uh, no, no, sorry, not both of them for the first time, but uh, they had uh, very strong female candidates as well, very uh, strong women, well-known throughout the region. So that's going to make a change because people are going to start to look up and, and pay more attention to what the other parties are having to say. Uh, so I don't know if he's thinking that there's some mm -hmm. uh, broader trend or something like that, but uh, I, I would say that you need more political analysis uh, to, to really determine what might be going on. But in my experience, uh, in the last election, we had uh, two very strong new candidates come forward, and I think that's only good for democracy. Well, the other thing I would notice, because it covered the campaign, was that John Horgan chose to focus a great deal of his campaigning effort in the region where he calculated he had the best chance to win to add seats. Uh, to the NDP column, and he knocked off 10 liberal seats in and around Metro Vancouver. And he spent an awful lot of his time campaigning there. And it worked. Uh, and I mean, victory tends to provide its own justification. He didn't spend as much time campaigning in the north and the interior as some NDP leaders have in the past. But the next campaign, the d dynamic could be totally different. That's right. I mean, uh, each campaign, I would say, is reflective of the particular space and time that it that exists in. And so um, this last election, um, there were increased ridings in the lower mainland. Uh, the population there is growing. And uh, I would say um, the views of people were shifting there mm -hmm. as well, right? Especially with the affordability crisis being the epicenter of the lower mainland. And so um, our leader spent more time there, but the attention, I'd say province-wide, mm -hmm. in terms of news and everything in the media, was focused there a lot more. I, I mean, maybe I'm just being a, a rural and we always complain well, about how the Lower Mainland gets all the attention, but it, it certainly seemed to be true. the case this election. And, and media resources are all concentrated there and all that. Are yep. you facing recall up there? Are they already talking about recalling you and your right? I know Andrew Weaver made mention of oh, that. Okay. Uh, my constituents, on the other hand, I got a lot of uh, letters of support and um, some some choice words for Andrew and okay. his suggestion. <laughs> Thank you very much to Minister Mungal for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Very Thank good. Thank you. Thank you. Always Thank a pleasure. Thanks for watching Voice of BC, bringing the legislature BC politics into your living room. Good night. Straight at work.